All right. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I am excited to have you all join us for our final winter quarter graduate group in education Monday seminar. And I'm excited to present our, um, today's presenters uh, uh, who are part of the McDonald Foundation Teachers as McDonald Foundation funded Teachers as Learners project that um, I'm a part of. So I'm going to quickly turn things over because I know um, there'll be further introductions, but I'm going to turn things over to Lee Martin, um, Associate Professor in the School of Education and Casey Mastrip and um, Liam Aiello, who are postdoctoral fellows with the Teachers as Learners Project. Uh, thank you, Danny. Um, thanks to uh, everybody for joining us today. Um, it's, it's nice to see you and uh, it's you know, kind of nice to have a smaller group. We can keep things a little casual. Uh, Casey, I think is going to, there we go, uh, share the screen and, and we'll be, um, helping move things along. So today we want to we want to share a little bit about what we've been up to. Um, but it's it's a big team. So this will be really we want to give a bit of an overview um, and then a little slice of some of the data that we've been um, considering. So uh, Casey, if you could go to the next slide, I want to begin by asking you to kind of take a little mental trip backwards in time. Um, and really think about fall 2020. I think never before in my life as a researcher has it uh, been so important to pinpoint the date at which things have happened, right? Now imagine, so you think about that time in your experience, and, uh, but imagine that you are a secondary English language arts teacher. So you've just, you've gotten through the emergency distance teaching and learning of spring 2020. You've made it through the, the summer of kind of uh, whatever that looked like for you, but a, a break from your teaching responsibilities. And now you've learned that this is not a, a flash, you know, this is, the, it, the crisis isn't over, but you're going to be continuing on in this distance capacity for some time. Um, so we have this quote, I, I feel like I'm a first year teacher all over again, trying new things out and seeing what sticks, uncertain of what move to make next. This is a quote from one of our teacher partners, and I'll I'll give some more context to that in a moment. Um, and if you could go next, Casey. So here, this is sort of the context in which we wanna present a, a slice of our data. This moment in time as teachers are really contending with a massive disruption to their teaching practice and their goals. Um, within this group of uh, teachers, who we have been, had been working with for a couple of years as teacher partners and design partners on our grant, and really working to understand the ways in which they made a, a pretty significant adaptation in their practice. That's the moment we want to explore in a little bit of depth. And that moment, yeah, you can go to the next one, Casey. As we talk about that, this it's a there were two things going on, right? This is kind of build the plane as we're flying it, a bit of design research, where pedagogically, we were trying to create a learning space for these teachers to support them through a really challenging moment, um, you know, as teachers, and but also to think as researchers and to take this as an opportunity, really, to understand teacher learning, to understand adaptation, moment of crisis. The next slide. Uh, so first, we're gonna. I'll I'll say a little bit about the overview of the bigger project really quickly then um, highlight a couple of key analytic ideas. And then I'm gonna pass the baton to Casey, um, who's gonna take us into the uh, little uh, bit of data and our work in progress analysis here as we're trying to make sense of this. So what's the, the broader project here, as Danny alluded to? Um, so this is a, a grant with quite a few of us here at UC Davis on this grant, looking at how teachers learn to enact what we are calling disciplined improvisation, kind of in the moment, thinking on their feet work that teachers have to do to be responsive um, and to facilitate authentic conversations, classroom discourse about academic text in English language arts classrooms in culturally and linguistically diverse classrooms. So, you know, this is on looking at this enactment and this in the moment adaptation and decision making. And this work is funded from a grant from the McDonald Foundation. And you'll see on the next slide, we have a, we have a great team, a lot of folks here at UC Davis. So uh, Steve Athanasius is our PI, Kristen Blair is at Stanford, and then 
Jenny Higgs, myself, Danny Martinez, Alexis Patterson, and Megan Welsh, uh, faculty here in our School of Ed, joined by Leah Maiello and Casey Mestrup, uh, who will be uh, really instrumental in this work that we're talking about today as postdocs. And then we have this fabulous group of teacher partners, all of whom are alumni of our UC Davis teacher education program and have come back to be design partners and thinking partners and research partners on this grant with us. And if we go to the next slide, so uh, you can see we there are a number of different strands, right? It's a big project, a lot of uh, co-PIs. And so just to highlight what some of these are, we have a group of folks looking at uh, teaching simulations using the platform of Mersion, uh, which uh, is really interesting work. Um, Megan and Jenny are particularly involved in that. It's a lot of work with collaborative authorship with our teacher partners to involve them as authors, communicators to teacher audiences. We have work in pre-service teacher education, um, particularly in the 206B course that um, and Steve's work there. We have uh, work with cognitive field notes that we have our teacher partners doing and expand that um, that Danny and Liam have been really involved with and we'll mention a bit now. It's a broad focus on the team on noticing for equity, developing an inner witness that Alexis has been really um, taking a leadership role on there and is developing further and we'll allude, allude to that a little bit today. And then it's work with contrasting cases and video platforms that um, quite a few of us are working on, myself, Kristen Blair from Stanford, um, and uh, Liam and Casey have been involved really on all of these things as well. So a lot going on in the project um, and happy to talk with anybody more about these things in, in the Q&A as well. For our teacher partners, we really want to emphasize that, um, as I said, these are alumni. They're working with us as design partners. Um, so they're helping us develop and test our tools and processes. They're providing insights into what's uh, you know, on the ground, what's working for them in classroom discussions, what's working in their classrooms. This has been uh, important throughout, particularly important in this really new territory. Of, of online space, um, since none of us have that direct experience, um, and working to think about how we can educate uh, new teachers um, and provide the best materials for them moving forward. So that's a bit of the broader context, introduction to our teacher partners. And then we wanted to say a little bit, just a, a preview of this, uh, central theoretical framework around noticing. So teacher noticing um, is an uh, important idea on how teachers um, sort of make sense of their classrooms. And so when we say teacher noticing, uh, we're taking uh, up these ideas from Hand, uh, Van Ness and others that this is not just kind of the, the attending to or sort of noticing in that sense, but it really involves attending to interpreting and responding to student thinking in their classrooms. Um, and the kind of teaching that we and our teacher partners are looking to enact is dialogic instruction where uh, teachers are really attending to their, uh, their students talk and their ideas and facilitating this open discourse. And so this really relies upon quite sophisticated teacher noticing. And uh, doing so is guided um, as my colleagues here have, have noted in, uh, in their published work, it depends on multiple factors, but notably on teachers' uh, own cultural experiences, their teacher preparation and their pedagogical commitments. These inform what it is that they notice, how they, you know, what they attend to, how they interpret it, and how they respond. And in our team, uh, we've taken this uh, further by talking about three different lenses. And this has really been a cross-cutting idea that's informed uh, our work um, across these multiple different strands. Um, and so I will very quickly mention, you know, try to describe what these are to set the stage um, while acknowledging that we're glossing over a lot of important detail. The first noticing lens is noticing for discourse. Um, so this is where uh, noticing that helps teachers to ensure that 
uh, students are talking to one another in quote unquote productive ways. So, you know, turn taking, uptake, building on each other's ideas, following classroom norms around talk. Um, and as noted here, this includes both teacher moves and really attending to student responses. The next lens uh, that we talk about, um, and not that they're in a particular order, is noticing for equity. Um, so here, this lens involves noticing, as it says, for individual and collective safety and support and for equitable distribution of talk and participation. And noticing for equity um, is uh, attending to issues around uh, language, uh, race, uh, historical and sociopolitical context that we would think about in terms of equity and participation, as well as uh, sort of uptake of the kinds of ideas that are gonna be surfaced in, in classrooms as well. And then the third lens would be noticing for disciplinary learning in English language arts. So here, this is focusing on how students talk and interpretation are sort of taking up ideas from the text, disciplinary ideas that it would be important in kind of framing the English language arts piece of this as well. So all three of these are essential and overlapping, but we've found uh, with our teacher partners um, and with all of us really that that pulling them apart and naming and labeling them has been extremely helpful in gaining clarity uh, in our work and in supporting the teacher partners and um, you know I think this would be a great thing for us also to, to chat about afterwards and I'm delighted to have colleagues here who've really been uh, leading and developing these lenses. So if we go to the next uh, slide here, the specific slice that we uh, of data from this big project that we want to talk about today is again focused on how this group of teacher partners adapted their noticing practices in the face of these big disruptions uh, seen because of the COVID nineteen pandemic and the the shift to distance learning. Um, so to preview what we're going to say we found to help as an organizing framework, uh, one thing was that teachers' ability to see classroom discussion was disrupted with this shift to a different format. And then I think the, the emerging finding here is it's three part. One is that these adaptations were really done collectively, not individually, and they involved the adoption of new tools for noticing and relied on adopting new definitions of key concepts. And these things were really uh, interwoven. Tools and definitions sort of renegotiated and made sense of in collective discourse and how, and how that was facilitated. So in terms of this disruption of the ability to see, um, if we think of the sort of pre-COVID context, which we before COVID just thought of as like normal teaching, there are all sorts of different kinds of things that teachers might be attending to in their classroom work, right? Who is speaking, looking for things like, you know, where ideas be, you know, are students building on each other's ideas? Are they taking up each other's ideas? Like, you know, what is, what are they saying in terms of ELA content? What's the modality of the language that they're using, language types and registers? Um, you know, what's the overall amount of talk? Like nobody's talking in my classroom versus it's really robust. Body language, other paralinguistics cues, you know, really rich opportunities for noticing. And if you then switch to the kind of Zoom context, and I think many of us have had this experience of like, you're teaching to lots of black boxes and you don't know if people, you know, what's going on with people. A lot of these cues for noticing just felt like they had disappeared, that they didn't have access to these, all these sources of information. And so they felt really uncertain of what was going on. And so this is part of what we mean by this disruption. And on the next slide, we have a couple of quotes from our teacher partners. Um, so when we asked them to describe instances where students were citing and building, referencing texts, asking about questions about comprehension, one teacher said, uh, no, those are things I would encounter normally, but I really just have not seen anything like that so far in distance learning. The structure is so different. So their ability to see was disrupted. And another teacher here um, 
is thinking about like, how can they, you know, like what can they do in this space um, and expresses, you know, I think a lot of creativity, but also uncertainty. I, think I wanna give a survey to see where they are, but the students that I'm worried about do not respond to messages, chats, warm up check-ins, emails. How do I gauge how they are doing when I'm not getting any feedback? How can I get students to not give up? How do I move on when I have so many students falling behind? Would this be the time to try something new? Is introducing new tech bringing them out or keeping things interesting? I want to learn how to engage students when I don't even know if they are there. Uh, so this was the context, you know, some of these come from these reflections. This was the context of disruption and striving for understanding to be able to notice student, uh, students thinking, to be able to make sense of the idea of classroom discourse in this really new and challenging setting. Um, and so I think this is where I'm gonna tap, pass the baton to Casey, if I'm remembering right. Um, uh, and Casey uh, with Liam and Steve and others, they were really like in the mix of this sense-making. And so Casey, I hand it over to you and you can talk about um, a little bit more about the, the pedagogical moves that you made as you know, in facilitating these conversations and then the kinds of data that, that we gathered and are working to make sense of. Uh, and I'm also going to put a chat, uh, a link in the chat to the to the paper I alluded to. Awesome. So um, I really appreciate how Lee kind of is setting that framing in the stage. And, and I think there's this other part of it that the teacher partners were really kind of had spent time working through these different lenses in the face-to-face -face context. And so, you know, there was this initial thought that like we can just shift into this new space and like keep working forward. Um, and, and so we really noticed this tension and um, and these kind of disruptions in their practice surfacing that was kind of putting like a gestalt to like what was what was moving kind of the work um, and the research and exploration forward. And so when we were thinking about how to approach to support the partners, we really thought through some different goals about how are we facilitating their own um, reflections on their practice. Um, how are we providing windows into what's going on in their classrooms? And how are we also thinking about co-designing tools um, for their use as well as for our use as a, as a research team to support noticing in these remote settings? Because we knew, you know, this is not going to go away. This remote instruction is not going away. Um, and it stayed for a really, really long time. Um, and so there were some really, uh, we also were looking at, again, developing the theory on the noticing lenses. So as Lee already mentioned, there was these time constraints of like, we all know that shift happened so quickly. In spring, we thought maybe we were just dabbling in this online space. And then it was like, whoa, yeah, no, we're here for the year. Um, and so we really have this uncharted territory with this little time to plan. And so what um, I'll talk about today, and, and hopefully Liam will also elaborate on, is we really started focusing on a series of meetings and workshops to facilitate this collaborative adaptation. We wanted to introduce um, new noticing tools, and we wanted to think about discussion workshops for each tool. And so we'll, we'll, the next slide, I'll talk about each tool kind of in separation. We'll look at what we call the progress monitoring tool, as well as the ethnographic field notes, or also they're called cognitive field notes as well. And so um, what we did was we had some research questions, some data analysis. I'll give you a little bit of background on that, of what the data sources we're going to talk about today. Um, we have these different quarterly written teacher partner reflections. And so one thing that's so unique about this group of teacher partners is they really are inquiry driven. And that's that important context of coming from our program. Um, at the heart of their teaching, there's always this reflective practice and there's always this redesign um, and retooling of what's happening in their classroom. So these Wintner reflections became really, really critical to kind of unearthing some of the disruptions they were facing. We have lots of meeting notes and recordings, like. Liam and I recorded everything. And it was like, even when him and I would meet and plan, it's like, let's record this. Let's talk about what are these moves we're making. And then when we would meet with the partners, we would also record those sessions. Our analysis really isn't a work in process. And so I, I hope to have some more conversations today at the end about just ways of thinking and exploring and really looking at this inductive coding of reflection notes and meeting transcripts um, and looking at some identified themes from the data corpus. We'll kind of see that today. Um, and again, I think analysis is ongoing, as we all know, in our, um, in our social science work that we do when we're looking at um, teacher reflection and growth over time. So to get started in preparation, um, I feel like that slide for the, um, 
the PMT and the progress monitoring is coming up in a little bit. Um, so in preparation of launching fall to really think about what the partners were bringing into the digital space, we asked them to complete a, refresh, a reflection to help inform the scope of our work. When I say our work, we're thinking about like the research partner team, I'm um, thinking about the work with them. And so here are these little boxes that are summaries of their reflections. And so a lot of them talked about things like kids' emotional states. We talked about what real school is and they kept using that phrase, well, is this real school? Um, we, we talked, we, we talked to them about like the time frame that it takes to just engage students in logging on their screens. Student, how do we get students to students to interact with each other when again, they can't see each other's faces, they just see names. I mean, districts were not allowing students to turn cameras on for so long. So there was no student to student interaction. So these are kind of some of these themes that merge from their initial reflection about going in and launching the work of the fall. And so Liam and I and other members of the research team, we sat down and we said, well, what are some themes that we're seeing in these reflections? And we did a little initial binning before we even started planning the scope of work. And so we started seeing things about successful and positive tone. And now I know these are excerpts from their, their, um, their reflections. So when it says chat interaction, that might not seem like something successful or positive, but that's rooted in a conversation about the way that they're getting students to talk to each other, that that's a positive type of interaction. Um, those concern and struggles, I mean, a lot of them were feeling like they were sitting at their desk in front of their screen lecturing to their students, which is not how they were trained to facilitate and engage in these really rich dialogic practices with their students. And then there, there was other things about questions and their initial noticings that they had um, throughout the, the kind of the launching of that work. And so what we did was we really sat down as a team and, and when I, we said, well, how can we support the partners as we move through the pandemic, as we think about wanting to draw from the noticing lenses and wanting to continue to facilitate rich discussions online. And um, so this is kind of a summary of how we kind of pulled all that together. So all of these themes were connected to student engagement, interaction and participation. And you'll hear us talk a lot about those three big words today. Um, with noticing at the foreground of our work, we, we settled on two different tools, the progress monitoring tool and the cognitive ethno ethnographic field notes to help the, the teacher partners facilitate and renegotiate what these three words meant, engagement, interaction, and participation in the context of the distance learning space. So this really meant exploring with the teacher partners the ways in which class discussion had navigated to the remote forms and involving also tapping their needs for support, like what resources may they also need to help facilitate these conversations. So I mentioned the tools twice now, and I want to now kind of break them apart so you can also get a little sense of what the partners were doing with the two different tools. So when we think about the cognitive field notes, and these are just summaries, and I might go ahead and lean a little bit on Danny if he wants to add, or Liam if they want to add a little bit on anything that was left out in this space. And so this first tool is really a way for, for teachers to be really um, focused when they're thinking about capturing and documenting moves of tension in the classroom. Um, the partners were asked to collect lots of field notes over the course of the year, but we're focusing in on fall. So there was two sets of field notes in fall that they were asked to capture. Um, we disseminated those conversations in small groups to really discuss some of these key takeaways and moments of tension. It was really zoned in on those moments of tension. Um, it was really unique to have this access to their think time and um, how our team was adapting to these COVID restrictions, right? We're normally in the classrooms with them. So how do we get insight into seeing what's happening when we're not allowed in those spaces? These field notes kind of became our entry into that space. Um, and I think it's important to know that the partners have continued to use this tool even now back into the face-to-face -face context. Danny, Liam, is there anything you want to add to the cognitive field notes space? All right, cool. Um, and I know Megan is not here today to also add and build on this, but we also use the second tool, which is the progress monitoring tool. And so progress monitoring tools are simple data collection forms, right? And so teachers can use these to regularly track and automatically graph student behaviors during discussion. And so these are observable behaviors, things that you can actually like, you know, check on a 
uh, on a board. I remember when I was in the classroom teaching being like, okay, did I call on John today or Mary or Mark? And I would put little check marks on the seating chart, right? So things that we can actually observe and, and, and track. And so the partners were able to design their own tool to address different instructional concerns specific to their context. So when they're wondering like, is my student engaged? We're like, well, what is an observable behavior? Um, are their heads down in the Zoom screen? Is, is the camera on? What does that engagement look like that you can observe in, in the Zoom window? Um, and so they, they noted whether students unmuted, right, to make a contribution or whether they respond to each other's ideas, right? So I'm thinking about in the context of discussion. Um, and so this practice of regularly scoring behaviors really served as a reminder to notice um, the student behaviors in the moment and then also to reflect as change over time. So the partners were, you know, using, they were testing these tools, but they were also using these tools in their classroom to negotiate, again, those three terms, engagement, participation, and interaction, really trying to help us notice in the context of the pandemic. Liam, did I leave anything out about that tool in the context of its use? No? Okay. Um, and so there's a lot that happened over the span. And so as we introduce the, 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 the data in the next couple of slides, I just want to kind of take a step back so you can see how all of this unfolded over the term of the quarter. Um, and so, you know, we started in October, we're, we're kind of wrapping it up in December 15th. This is all of the 2021 um 2020 it would be 2020 still uh school year and so you'll see some of these themes that started to happen across the whole entire fall quarter we had these disruptions to these preconceived notions these were themes that kept coming up in all these different tools that they were using they started using the interactions with the tools way early in the quarter um, and they were doing these small work group meetings and they kind of broke apart and focused in on their own tool to really kind of determine is this tool going to help us facilitate and negotiate these new meanings of terms. Um, around mid fall they started really grappling with how to redefine and how to make some new noticing and by the towards the end of fall quarter we really started making these collaborative adaptations moves and in the shifting into winter quarter we really see them starting to change their language in their field notes um, around and in their conversations around facilitation of student um, discussion in their classrooms and what um, how students are being engaged interacting and participating together. So let's turn to some of the emerging themes that um, kind of came about, and then we'll show some data that goes along with it. So we, we again, stress that these adaptations were collective. It was really amazing kind of to see, and these weren't just like, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. It was like really focused on being um, adaptive together. Uh, they also arose in these interactions among the tools. And so the tools became that instrument for that um, space of noticing. Um, and also grappling with different theory and new definitions. Again, I mentioned these are our candidates that are really rich in inquiry and they know the noticing lens is really well. And they're like, well, I'm not sure. Like, what is like my whole noticing of what a discussion really means? Like, is it just talking to each other? Is Does it count in chat? It was these really rich, robust um, adaptations and redefining together. So I'm going to show a slice of data. Uh, let's take a look at how some of the partners interacted with um, the tool. So this is a slice of the field note. Um, this comes at like the end of the field note. They go through and they describe the moment. This happened in November. This is the second field note for this partner. Um, and so she describes this moment that was happening um, in the classroom with a student. And it was like this redundancy of trying to get her kids involved. So she was just walking through like, man, I, I, you know, I think it, they should get it by now. It's November. And so she talks about reflecting on the situation, the whole, both with this individual student, and all of my students this term really at a loss. Um, and so I've highlighted some ways that these tensions, these adaptation needed, and these noticing for equity are pulling out in this reflection. I often remind myself of what um, was said to us as pre-service teachers. You teach the class that you have, meaning not the class that you want, or the class that you have in another period. Um, it makes every interaction tense because I feel defensive. I know what I am doing has, um, I know what I am doing has and does work. Again, that tension of like, I did this before, this should be working, why isn't it? Um, also that I am doing what all the other 12th grade teachers are also doing. Liam, do you wanna build upon this meaning or do you want me to shift to the next one about the PMT before we start talking more about redefining? Okay. 
Um, so interactions, another interaction with the tool, the PMT. So again, those are those focus on those observable behaviors, looking at tensions around what to observe in new context. So the teachers had to really put their like inquiry hats on with this. So these are what their graphs looked like after they were doing these marking and codings. And so they were taking these graphs and they were pairing them with the field notes. And then they were thinking about like reflecting on this space. So here's a reflection that's tied to this teacher partner. And so she was tracking how much are students unmuting, how much are students replying in the chat, and how much are students responding to other students. So looking at specific moves in discussion, right? So we, we, you know, tracking this back onto the noticing lens of equitable talk in a classroom or equitable participate, participation in a classroom. And so she, while, while she felt that these tools are helpful, she still feels like she's struggling with the right questions to ask. Like, what am I supposed to be looking for? What am I supposed to be seeing in these digital spaces? Um, how does she want to, um, you know, apply this to record and observe in her own class? And so this really ties into the kind of the transition we made with the new definitions and new noticing moving forward. I also am also aware of the time there. So these next slides are just more data slides that add to this rich this conversation that they had about entering into this new definition and new noticing space. So Lee, if I'm correct, you and the partners did this in the context before the pandemic, right? Where you guys looked at these adaptive expertises and you kind of had a model like this that you moved around, is that correct? Uh, it was sort of like it was in May. So it was before we knew it was gonna stretch on forever, I think. Right. And so they had been familiar with thinking about different components of definitions and really trying to um, flesh those out and, and what are student moves that connect to these components. So we asked them this question, how are you viewing and seeing these different components of discussion unfold in the digital space? Um, what might be some of the interconnections between um, when students are discussing between their engagement, participation and interaction? So I'm gonna highlight what some of the models that they made together. So here's a model from one of the partners. And so she built this pyramid or this kind of outer structure here. And you can see these different arrows that she is imposing. Green arrows equaling an increase, right? So there's an increase in written participation from the, you know, the Zoom chat and the Google assignments. Um, there's an increase in verbal communication coming through tools like Flipgrid. Um, and there's a decrease in written things like an email um, from, you know, pre-pandemic space to the distance learning space. Another partner conceptualized it in a completely different way. Um, really thinking about, um, I don't know, almost like this really interesting figure eight space. And then we have another partner who even conceptualized it in another way. And so I think what's really fascinating about all three of these different data slides is we have these individuals working to notice together, working to come up with these definitions together and really gra grappling with these three different terms. It kind of all culminated together when we did a debriefing of the engagement where we actually asked them to put some text to the words. And so they really started revamping and reviewing engagement, interaction, and participation in kind of these different bins and buckets. Are students volunteering to talk, right? Are students typing um, versus, you know, um, through and out and well-articulated sentence in preparation for discussion? So doing pre-work for discussion now. Are they talking with each other in breakout rooms? Are they responding to each other either in the chat or um, in, the, in the Zoom space? Are they actually just completing tasks? And then there's another big long list of, um, of definitions with that space there. Um, leading to kind of a little summary of, we talked about these disruptions to preconceived notions, um, really looking back again, as the teachers reflected that they needed to restructure and reconceptualize what discussion meant in the digital space, rather than just shifting to their in-person understandings to the digital space. These are kind of some of the reflections towards the end of fall quarter when they started to converge together on a um, collaborative adaptive definition. 
right? So what counts as discussion during distance learning? Finding these possible answers with the group, wanting to find that space together, um, and reflecting meaningful on whether these standards are met, how often and during what kind of activities. And so to support teachers noticing in this new context, the research team really kind of aided the partners in implementing these tools, right? The progress monitoring tool and the ethnographic field notes marrying together. Um, and while that work was done individually, they really shared their findings as a group and these patterns emerge and what they discussed um, as they were supported and redefining these notions around these three big terms. And so we kind of have some tentative implications here uh, that you know we're, we're really excited to keep moving forward with and exploring and having conversations together today, as well as um, as we dive into more of the analysis. But really looking at learning to see anew is a critical form of learning a, an adaptation. Um, we see these adaptations and seeing and in practice involves in these this intersecting triad of tools for noticing. We grappled with this in a conceptual space and we were a community of learners together. Um, and then I think that last slide is just our team again, that was all part of that process here of working together in collaboration um, and really grappling with some of these kind of bigger, harder contexts. Yeah, and I, uh, I put that last yeah. slide in there just to re reiterate that this is really a collective endeavor, you know, even though you heard Casey and my voices the most uh, in the past few minutes, uh, that this is really uh, collaborative work distributed ac across this this team. So, you know, if if we have some discussion, then I th if a number of these folks are also here in the in the meeting with us. Thank you. Oh, we'll start off with Rebecca. Go ahead. Well, since I'm preparing to teach 206B um, to the math credential candidates in the spring quarter. I'm curious about the field note tool and um, whether that was like an app that they had uh, or whether it was just the general notion of field notes. And then we talk about the difference between in the midst and after the fact, and I assume these are after the fact. So tell me more about field notes and how the teachers use those, please. Thank you. I can start and then Liam, you can jump in. Yeah, so so um, thank you, Rebecca, for that question. And, and I'll just, I'm gonna put a link to um, the article. So we're drawing on and extending the work of um, Chris Gutierrez and Shirin Lusugi, who talk about the use of cognitive field notes for um, learners in a paper there that they, they presented, where they're just, these individual cognitive field notes become these spaces to track changes over time and to really um, have, our teacher partners in this, in our case, really reflect on what was happening and, and, and the approach we were taking. We wanted to know what was happening in their um, distant learning classrooms. Um, so we gave them, they had a full, full knowledge of, of, of the learning for equity lens, noticing for, for equity lens, um, excuse me, the noticing lenses. Um, and that really framed how they were writing up their field notes, their cognitive field notes. And they did this, it wasn't an app. We gave them the template and they um, wrote, their cognitive field notes based on the template we provided, which um, really asked them to, to select a specific moment that was kind of nagging at them, or it just really, they noticed it in the moment when they were teaching and they wanted to think deeply ar around that specific moment. Um, Lee, you can go, feel free and add anything while I put that link up. Yeah, sure. I, um, you know, I've, I've used similar formats to gathering information from pre-service teachers about their classrooms and getting to reflect on it. And sometimes they're referred to as field notes. But what the work that we're doing with these teacher partners is attempting to add a level of robustness to when a pre-service teacher educator might use these with teachers. For example, highlighting the noticing lenses and seeing how that mediates their use of field notes. Um, being really careful about facilitating spaces where field notes are collectively analyzed and what that means for teacher inquiry. Um, using field notes in a time of digital learning and seeing how one round of field notes can represent a lot of despair and frustration and how rounds two, three, and four can start to incorporate new ideas about discussion where they start documenting interactions that quite honestly don't look like a Socratic seminar, do not look like a text discussion. That's in a chat room where a kid is complaining about the workload. They've decided to pick those moments of pedagogical tension to document in the field notes. And it can be really surprising to debrief that with others and be like, how does this help us now then learn about discussion? So there are just some ways that we see us taking a structure that could be used 
in a lot of different ways with teacher educators and pushing it in just a few specific directions. Um, just as a follow-up, why do you call them cognitive field notes? Mm -hmm. Again, I, that's gonna, I'm gonna go back to the Bethesda and Vosogi piece and, and their, their approach is really thinking about, um, unlike for, for the practitioners that we are working with, unlike um, the, the field note, the anthropo anthropological field notes that we would take where we'd just be there and observe, for perhaps engaging in participant observation, um, this is really working towards tracking the shifts that the learners are engaged with through um, the documenting of what they're seeing um, over time. So unlike the field notes that a researcher would take, where we're trying to notice patterns about the community in which we are doing investigations on, this is some inward looking, um, um, a space for inward looking and to think about how over time there, there, there can be some shifts in practice, um, shifts in um, uh, even in, in the reflective practices, really shifts in how they go back and engage in their pedagogical um, practices. Um, and, and Gutierrez and, and Roga, uh, Vasogi will argue that this is just one way to, to capture teacher learning and how we learn um, in different contexts and, and, and being able to document that across time and space. Thanks, just as a um, follow-up comment, um, when I read the teacher inquiry literature about it rich, writ, writ large, um, especially for pre-service teachers, often there's a tension between whether we want sort of a journaling activity where it's how are you feeling and sort of how are you doing and maybe very vague um, versus what I think I do, which is drive much, much toward the empirical and just what happened in your classroom, get rid of all those feelings. Um, so it sounds like this may be kind of a, um, a compromise between those two where there is some introspection. So it is sort of what matters to you, not just what happened. Um, so do I have that right? I see Liam thinking there, so. I'd agree with you. I, I think that there's this, that's a nice way of putting it. Um, there certainly is emotionality and feelings that bring that they bring to bear to it. But when we think about the interpretation aspect of noticing, this is an insight into that black box. You can they can explain really clearly what they're attending to, but when they start to elucidate their interpretations of it, that's when we have are given a lot to unpack. And the feelings are one component of that. But we've begun to hear the teacher partners just use some really they walk through just the, the moments of where they're feeling true being pulled in two different directions really clearly. And it's like an insight into interpretation in a rich way. Chris, go ahead with your question. Sure, thank you. Uh, hi everybody. And yeah, sorry if I missed this earlier, I'm actually outside right now on a farm, but listening as I'm doing some stuff. And um, I kind of wanted to build on Rebecca's question a little bit about the uh, cognitive field notes and the, the idea of moments of tension. Um, and I'm just curious how you, how you all defined moments of tension, if you gave any guidance to writing and reflecting on what could be considered a moment of tension. I'm just asking that because I, you know, I think tension doesn't have to mean conflict and tensions can also, can also be productive. And, and so, yeah, I'm just kind of curious about that little methodological piece. Go ahead, Lee. Uh, you know, all my colleagues can comment on this. I, it's, it's, you put, you really put your finger on it, Chris, tensions as productive spaces for learning. Um, we've been really mining the idea of the, th the three lenses noticing framework and how sometimes we define tensions as being pulled in two different competing directions. Um, for when it comes to discussion facilitation, the feeling of when to step in or when to step back, or to encounter students' use of rich but non-academic language and wondering whether you should uh, assert that they should use academic language or you should follow their and value their um, you know, use of their own linguistic repertoires. There's, I'm putting it in terms of like two different choices, but when we listen to teacher partners describe being in moments of tension, feeling like they're being pulled in two different directions, um, we find those as moments to like highlight in their field notes and to discuss with one another. 
uh, because we find them to be not wished away, not to be perhaps solved immediately, but to be like sat with for a little bit. And I would just add that another term that we use for attentions, especially around the different lenses, is the is competing priorities. Um, so we value students learning the language of a discipline, right? In, in engaging in the language of a discipline to kind of build on the example. Um, but we also know that there's power and value in students um, using their home language. Um, and so which, which of these lenses are we going to uplift in that moment? And which are we going to maybe background in the moment? And so there are these competing priorities that educators are experiencing, and they experience these things as attention in terms of deciding what are they going to, what are the lenses are they going to foreground and what are they going to background in terms of their, the sense that they're making of the situation and how they respond. We have time for perhaps one more quick question. I'm just, um, another comment. I'm just struck at the difference between math and, and um, English here in that we have visual um, space that's really important to our communication. And I think that's less so in a conversation about an English text. Um, so it just intrigues me. I've often thought, oh, well, we can have these sort of general um, principles about discussion, um, but especially given the importance of um, notation and, and these concepts for math that the um, visual space provides a, a venue that you don't have so much of in in english or maybe they're using it i don't know because like we use jamboard i use jamboard all the time with my students and i don't think you guys use jamboard so much but maybe you do maybe they've been using it i see jenny has a point i guess i could have just said it <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were running out of time, but I, no, I was just saying, I appreciate that point. And we've actually talked to a bunch about like, what are the things that, uh, what are the tools that actually support discussion? Because I don't think um, we shine a light on that oftentimes, you know, like uh, the, the oral um, discussion happens, but sometimes there's like a written prompt ahead of time or maybe a visualization, you know, or a mapping or something. And sometimes that gets, um, you know, that doesn't get as much analytical attention. So um, yeah. Yeah, it, we are we are starting to think about that, but I don't think it has it, it gets as um, pronounced maybe as much as just like a taken for granted thing. Like you know, we gather around this as a as a space to make meaning. You know, I think that's been a, a sort of an interesting place in this project. Just having a a team that with interdisciplinary backgrounds, as many of us have tried to come to understand what like what English language arts is all about, you know, myself not coming from that as a, a focused background. And, and so those kinds of questions have been really interesting. So interesting to, to raise it in this context as well, Rebecca. Well, thank you all for joining us today. I think that the, you took us right to the hour, so I appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks for joining us and, and um, we look forward to having a, a, a great schedule for the spring quarter. Um, so please look out for that soon. But till then, thank you. And um, please email any of us if there are any more questions. <laughs>